Welcome to our Lord's Day service of worship on this June 7th, 2020, a day in which we remember uh, the great gift of the idea of the Trinity, uh, this doctrine of the Church, the relational nature of the divine. My name is David Spollett, and on behalf of uh, my colleague, the Reverend uh, Vanessa Payne Rose, and deacons uh, Clara Harmon and Andrew McInnes, who will be leading worship uh, with me this morning, and uh, to Deacon David McInnes and to Sherry Ivan, our Minister of Children's Music and Congregational Life, who are doing all the technical work behind the scenes uh, for make it possible for us to worship God in word and in sacrament. Today we will celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, so if you've not already done so, uh, let me suggest that you uh, take a moment to uh, gather up some bread or juice or uh, some toast and tea, uh, whatever it is, uh, to make it uh, consecrated by our gathering uh, for the sacrament of the Last Supper, Lord's Supper, which Jesus has given to us. I want to thank everybody uh, who participated this past week and made the vigils that we uh, co-sponsored in two houses, one home with First Baptist Church of Stratford. First on Thursday night here, and then in Stratford on a rainy Friday night, uh, to remember uh, George Floyd and all those uh, who have died due to white racist violence, and to commit ourselves and energize and commission ourselves, as it were, for the continuing work of anti-racism in America, working uh, for racial justice. And I'm very pleased and proud, actually, of you and all of our congregation and our fellow brothers and sisters at First Baptist for coming together in a, a strong and public witness. Uh, you can look at our Facebook page uh, where there's a, a um, album of photos and we'll be posting more uh, on that as they become available. If you have prayer requests uh, this morning and would like us to share those with the congregation, uh, please do send them on uh, Facebook Live and we'll uh, include them in our prayers this morning and anything that arrives uh, late uh, will be held in our hearts this week and then also shared with the congregation uh, next Sunday. Great thanks uh, for all of your generous gifts for the Mercy Learning uh, Center Emergency Food Pantry. You know the details of this. The need is very dire for these mothers and their children uh, during the uh, lockdown and the loss of jobs and employment. Uh, so please continue to bring your, uh, your food, non-perishable, and uh, gift cards for Stop and Shop or ShopRite or CVS or Walgreens uh, to the church before Thursday afternoon so they can be delivered on Friday afternoon. Uh, thanks to Teresa Harris who brought it over this past week and to Connie Christie, uh, to Peter and Barbara Franson who have helped uh, deliver in past weeks. Wonderful gift, thank you very, very much. So next Sunday, a couple of uh, things coming up. Normally we would begin our uh, worship services on Sasco Beach on the second uh, Sunday of June, which this year is next week. Uh, the town's not ready to uh, give us uh, that permission uh, on public lands, but we do have the authority uh, uh, under the governor's uh, recent decision to assemble up to 150 people in outdoor worship. So we will begin next Sunday at 8.15 on the lawn in front of the church. Um, bring your lawn chairs, your beach chairs, a blanket, or, or maybe a pillow, I don't know. Uh, but come down uh, to the lawn and we'll worship God there. In the case of uh, heavy rain, uh, we will not uh, hold that service uh, at all. 10.15, live streaming will continue as uh, well uh, throughout the summer um, at this time. And next week also at 2 o'clock, pray that there's no rain, we want you to come back uh, to the lawn in the front of the church opposite the town green. We're going to have a bring your own picnic basket picnic uh, to say goodbye and farewell, Godspeed and deep, deep thanks uh, to Paul Jacobson. Dr. Jacobson's last Sunday will be this next uh, and the following week on I think the 17th or 18th. The moving van is coming uh, to take his goods and then followed by Paul. Uh, to Muncie, Indiana, where he will soon begin uh, his uh, term as the, he's been elected to be rector of Christ Church in Muncie. We love Paul, deeply thankful for his ministry with us for nearly four years, and uh, pray that God speed in his new ministry 
uh, with hearts that are sad to see him go, but spirits that rejoice that he may fulfill his vocation as a priest um, in his new parish. So that's at two o'clock next Sunday, the 14th. Uh, bring a picnic basket, a beach lawn, chairs, whatever, um, and we'll gather on the lawn to give thanks to God. So then let us uh, take a few more moments uh, to center our hearts and minds uh, during the interlude as we prepare for the call to worship. Let us join with Deacon Clara Harmon in this morning's responsive call to worship. Good morning. Let us join in the responsive call to worship printed in your bulletin. We have come this day to worship you, O Lord, our sovereign. How majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established. What are humans that you are mindful of them and mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them the responsibility to care for your works of your hands, all sheep and oxen, and also the beast of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have formed a bulwark of strength and hope. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Please join together in singing, sing praise to God, our highest good.
Let us join in the prayer of invocation and the Lord's Prayer. Eternal God, your spirit brooded over the waters and you called forth creation. You have fashioned the heavens and the earth. Your creative energy has done all these marvelous works. Your spirit moved over the water of our baptism and you called us to be disciples of Jesus. Holy Spirit, come to us today as we remember your creation and our baptism to show us how to care for all your creatures. Let your creative spirit be at work in our hearts and minds today as we worship you in Christ through whom we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, good morning. I think I've messed up here. I tried to move, and now I seem to have lost the connection. Oh dear. It's good, David. We can hear you. Can you see me? Yes, we can see you and hear you. Okay, great. Well, I'm outside in the garden uh, here, the Garden of Hope that has uh, been worked on this summer by a bunch of folks. The principal person who's behind it is Harper Treshek, and I want to thank Harper for all the work that she's done. I don't know what you can see. Can you see the beautiful ferns behind me? Could you say that? Tell me if you can see it. Okay. You can see it. Oh, good. Great, great, great. And there's a beautiful rose bush over here. I think you can see that too. And a wonderful cross that's made out of stones that Hop has been building. And let me see if I can get up off the ground. Ah, oh, here we go. Okay. Look at this. I don't know if you can. Can you see that, Hop? The, uh, when I tried this before it worked, does it show up now? And yes. It's got these stones of hope in it. You will always find a way back to the light, says one of them. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. You are my sunshine. That's one of my favorite songs. You are my sunshine. Listen, I'm going to come inside here now. Hopefully I've got the connection. I'm not sure if you can see me or hear me. But I want to tell you that this is the great message of the scriptures. God is a relationship. We have a relationship with God. When we talk about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, we're really talking about how we are all joined together in one family, how God works in our lives in so many different and wondrous ways. So today, enjoy this beautiful sunshine. Get out in your garden. Remember that God is gardening in our lives, and we are one with each other and with God. Amen. Good morning. I want to light the candle of witness this morning for the Black Lives Matter movement. On Tuesday afternoon, I attended a protest through Fairfield, and on Thursday night, I attended the candlelight vigil at First Church. It was great to see so many youth at both events, and it was so cool that the protest on Tuesday was organized by a fellow student of mine. Marching down the post road with hundreds of people from all over Connecticut, you could feel the anger and frustration of centuries of systematic racism, but you also felt so empowered because we are so ready for change. Seeing my peers show up and stand up against racism makes me hopeful that my generation can be the ones to build a world without racism. There's great promise for the future with the youth in charge. We cannot go back to the old normal. The old normal was only good if you were white. We need a new normal that is good for everyone. As Vanessa said Thursday, each day find an action that will bring transformation and healing, justice, and eventually, hopefully, in the not too distant future, peace. There's so much work to be done and so much change to come. Thank you. Oh, I'm on my way back from the garden. I'm on my way back from the garden. 
And here I am. That was a little experiment. I seem to have pushed the wrong button at some point, but I see now that I'm back. Am I back in my study? I think so. Okay. Well, this morning we're going to uh, read from Scripture two wonderful passages. Uh, first, first from the uh, book of Genesis, uh, words which will ring familiar, and then the concluding words of the Gospel of Mark. Again, words that I think with which you will find great familiarity. This is a Sunday when we do celebrate the Trinity. The Trinity is this large, complex, yet simple idea that God is three in one. This didn't come right away to the church. It's the church's attempt after, in its earliest years, after many centuries of understanding and living in a Christian community to describe what people were experiencing. The love of God made manifest in so many different ways. So it's not that we have three gods. There's one God, but that divinity gets expressed in a variety of ways. So I would like to say, as we begin uh, this sermon, if there are young folks um, with you, uh, there will be a point in the sermon itself where we'll be talking about um, the taking of a human life. Um, and it may not may, may not be something you want uh, your kids to hear, but I'll, I'll give you a highlight before we actually read that. It's a, it's a quote um, from Leo Tolstoy from uh, David Brooks' uh, recent book, The Second Mountain. So let us uh, read the word of scripture given to us by God. First, from the book of Genesis, beginning at chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, when God created, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was a formless void, and the darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God separated the light from the darkness and saw that the light was good. Let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good. This blessing of all creation, which will continue uh, throughout the book of Genesis, every time God creates this sense of expressed by God of the goodness, the wonder, the beauty of God's creation. Later on in chapter 1, God said, Let us make humankind in our own image, according to our own likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, Hear that echo from our call to worship? And over everything that creeps upon the earth. And so God created humankind in God's own image. In the image of God, God created them, male and female. God created them. This is a bedrock, <coughs> excuse me, the bedrock principle of our tradition. That in creation, God blesses, is pleased. God's heart is full to overflowing in the gift of creation. And <clears throat> this sense of our unity in God. Now, the Bible, of course, is not a scientific text. This is a religious text which teaches us the meaning and the power of our lives. It doesn't explain how creation happened, but in a sense addresses the question of why creation happens, and if that is so, then what are the implications for our lives? 
ironically, or perhaps not ironically, perhaps fittingly, science has shown us that in fact we do come from one mother. In the Bible, she's of course called Eve. The person who is the mother of all of humanity, we know of her, not personally of course, but through the works of archaeologists who have discovered the paleontologists who have examined the human remains of a human female who they dubbed Lucy. And if any of us goes on to one of the ancestry sites or does the chromosomal genetic studies, if we pursue them far enough, long enough, and with enough intricacy, we would discover that in fact each of us derives our life from the great rift valley that runs through eastern Africa. This great rift valley is the home, the beginning place of all humanity. And God who created all of us, beginning with Lucy, and then on down through the millennia to our own selves, wants us to live in that understanding of our unity in God and the God that we know through the ministry, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so from Matthew's Gospel, in the 28th chapter, the conclusion of Matthew's Gospel, after Jesus had been raised from the dead, he met his friends on a hill in Galilee, his disciples, where he had instructed them to meet him. And having met Jesus, this is what Matthew records. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw Jesus, they worshipped him, though some still doubted. And Jesus came, and he said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples, disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow everything that I have shown you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. Some believed and yet some still doubted. Not surprisingly, no one really fully expected in the fullness of their hearts the kind of resurrection that had been accomplished in those days. And Jesus spoke to them and uses words which become familiar to us in the formula of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but it's not the fully developed idea, but just this mystery of how God works in so many different and wondrous ways. But the key here, it seems to me, is that Jesus tells his disciples, who are all Jewish, Jesus is Jewish, he tells his disciples to go not just to Judea, the land of the Jews, but to go to all the world, the nations, as he says, go to all the peoples, all the different peoples in the world, to hear the good news of God in Jesus Christ, which is that God's love is for all people. This universal message about our unity in God, who is the father and mother of us all. This idea about our unity and the inherent dignity of each human person, which lies at the heart of the gospel, which of course, as we all know, has been so grievously and thoroughly uh, distorted and perverted in the long history um, of the world and particularly of our own nation in the historical vestiges of the racism which lie at the heart of the American story, um, coming to a land that was not empty, coming from Europe to the shores of North America where a large and vital and vibrant uh, culture of multiple cultures lived and 
engaging in activities, sometimes overtly lethal and oftentimes in inadvertently lethal, but always to the end of removing and dis establishing and expropriating the land and killing the native inhabitants of our shore. And then when the agriculture proved to be too daunting in Virginia, the purchase of Africans to make them into slaves, to build the wealth of the nation upon their backs and their unrequited toil. And how the church participated in this deep and troubling, tragic, sinful history, flying in the face of what the book of Genesis tells us, subverting and contravening Jesus' message that all people are to hear the good news that they are beloved of God, they, are dig they have the dignity of being God's child equal to and endowed with the same rights as any human being to come up with the idea that blacks and whites were inherently different and that blacks were inherently inferior. And ultimately in the early uh, 19th century, the idea that slavery is not a necessary evil, but coming up with the idea uh, promoted by John C. Calhoun, that slavery is a positive good. How did that happen? Where did that come from? But what, what is the genesis of that policy? that idea rather. The genesis of the ideas of the inferiority of one race, blacks to another, white, was to fulfill the uh, need of human beings to grasp and grab and control every element of their lives. It's greed, pure and simple. Um, it was a idea which took its uh, genesis out of the practice of enslaving people and in creating large architecture and of infrastructure of the inferiority of blacks, we are finding, as Andrew pointed out in his uh, poignant, a candle witness, how this is all, in a sense, coming home to roost, even in our own day. This has been a very tough period for our entire nation, um, and particularly for African Americans who are more heavily beset by the ravages of the coronavirus than any other people except the Navajo Indians um, in the far Southwest. Incidentally, not incidentally, not coincidentally, also people of color who have been historically uh, separated from and held back from uh, the benefits of citizenship in our nation. And so what do we derive uh, from this? What is, what is the future direction for us? For white people, it's to come to terms with the facts as they are, not as we would like them to be or as we think they are, but to come to, come to terms with the truth, to become awakened to the reality. And I think Andrew is right, that the generation that is coming behind me, behind us, so many of us, understands this in a way that we didn't until only very recently. I want to uh, share with you a, a very short uh, video that was produced by SALT, S-A-L-T. SALT is a um, ecumenical uh, website blog uh, that brings together culture and religion and uh, helps us get in touch, those of us who are white, People who are black do not need any uh, introduction to this fact, but people who are white need to hear uh, the experiences, the reality expressed in very simple terms um, in this wonderful little video. Ten rules. Ten rules. Ten rules. Ten rules of survival. Ten rules of survival if stopped by the police. Number one, be polite and respectful when stopped by the police. Be polite. Be respectful. Remember that your goal is to get home safely. Your goal is to get home safely. Your goal is to get home safely. I'm sorry. Number two, if you feel your rights have been violated, you and your parents have a right to file a formal complaint with your local police jurisdiction. Number three, 
do not, under any circumstances, get in an argument with the police. Number four, always remember that anything you say or do can be used against you in court. Number five, keep your hands in plain sight. Make sure the police can see your hands at all times. Number six, avoid physical contact with police officers. Do not make any sudden movements and keep your hands out of your pockets. Number seven. Do not. Do not. Do not. Do not. Do not. Do not. Do not run, even if you are afraid. Even if you're afraid. Number eight. Even if you believe you are innocent, do not resist arrest. Number nine. If you are arrested, do not make any statements about the incident until you are able to meet with a lawyer or public defense. Fender. Number 10, stay calm and remain in control. Watch your words. Watch your body language. Watch your emotions. Remember. Remember. Remember, your goal is to get home safely. Get home safely. Get home safely. For many of us who are descended from European ancestors, uh, don't have to worry about getting home safely. But in fact, African descendants do. Regardless of how high they might rise in society and academia or in business or social status, every black person in America lives with the knowledge that they can be subject to violence, often lethal. A brief excerpt from a column in this week's Christian Century by Dorothy Sanders Wells, who is a Episcopal rector in Germantown, Tennessee. She writes, few people know the name Michael Donald. I know that name because he was lynched in my ho hometown of Mobile, Alabama in 1981. Reverend Wells goes on to recount how, in fact, as a teenager, she had grown up with Michael Donald. They were in the same high school together separated by one year, and he was lynched in 1981. She remembers the virulence of the violence in which Trayvon Martin and Clementa Pickney and the eight members of Emanuel AME, Botham Jean and Ahmed Aubrey, most recently George Floyd, killed because they were black. She writes in, for all the 400 years that this land has been inhabited by people of European descent and people of color alike, faithful people have tried to justify the separation and the segregation, the subjugation of blacks. Some Christians have used the Bible to defend slavery and ideas of racial purity. But there is a difference between the Bible describing something and condoning it, our scriptures acknowledge the sinfulness of our human hearts, our tendency to deny the image of God, the imago dei, the image of God who created us in God's image, other people, our unwillingness to follow the commandment to love our neighbors as ourselves. Instead, we deem our neighbors who are others, who are different, who are black as intruders and threats. I now pray that Christians will begin to live more like Jesus and call out acts of injustice when we see them until such time when Christians and others alike are able to recognize that our collective fate rests in the well being of each person. Or as Dr. King said, 
if somebody's not free, nobody is free. This is that critical moment in our life. This is a moment when we cannot go back, as Andrew said, to the old normal, but must be actively engaged in building a new normal. As I said last week, if not us, who? If not now, when? This is the message of the Trinity, that the differences in which God works is not, a, not an indication of different gods, but the unity of God that finds expression in so many different ways. Our identity as the children of God, one to another and all in God, and our commission as Christians to go out and to preach the good news, which is God's love, not some empty hope for the future notion, but the reality of God's love and care and commitment that dignity of every human being, white, black, brown, yellow, red. There is no difference other than skin tone. Our hearts beat the same way, our brains work the same way, our souls desire the same thing. And to come to terms and to understand Sometimes that something is just simply wrong. Leo Tolstoy, one of the great minds of the Western world who called himself to account and was always trying to improve himself, had an experience um, when he was in Paris. And David Brooks quotes Tolstoy about his experience. And this is the part uh, that kids maybe don't want to listen to. Tolstoy had an experience that persuaded him that there is a good which is far greater than any intellectual knowledge or rational examination can reveal. It was an absolute truth, something that is self-evident, a phrase from our own Declaration of Independence, truths which are self-evident not revealed by human reason, but simply exist. Tolstoy was in Paris when he witnessed an execution. He wrote, when I saw how the head was severed from the body and heard the thud as it fell into the box, I understood, not with my intellect, but with my whole being that no theories or rationales could justify such an act. I realized that even if all the people on the earth found this action to be necessary according to whatever theory or ideology they might have, I knew that it was not necessary and that it was wrong. Therefore, my judgments must be based on what is right and necessary, and not on what people say or do. This truth, David Brooks, wonderful, wonderful book, The Second Mountain, okay. This is what we have to come to terms with. White people have to come to terms with. To recognize the truth, to no longer rationalize or excuse, but to embrace our identity, to recognize that our relationships are who we are. If we restrict our relationships with only with those who look like us, we diminish ourselves. If we live in a world where we only allow certain rights and privileges to those who look like us, if we don't recognize and come to terms with the fact that our relationships are who we are, just as God is who God is in a relationship, we are relationships are who we are. And we make that inner change, that soul work, that deepening of our consciousness, or perhaps the raising of our consciousness, then God's vision and hope for humanity might be fulfilled. That God's dream of justice and its fruit, which is peace, 
will come to be. Amen. Friends, as we come now to this time of joys and concerns, if you are joining us over Facebook Live I, and you have something you'd like us to pray over together, I invite you to post that in the comments and I will turn to those in a minute. You will also find in your bulletin the names of the people we are praying for this week. Those who have been affected by COVID-19, those on the front lines, and all those who have asked for prayers for healing for themselves and their family members. I have one great joy, and that is the leadership that has been shown over these past two weeks by our young people. It has really been powerful to see the younger people in our community take a stand, and I'm so grateful that so many are following their leadership. A concern which Deacon Petrina has asked to share with us, she says prayers for her requested her pain and trauma are real as a mother of two young adult sons. Katrina, we do hold you and your sons in our prayers. Charlene Jarrock asks for prayers for her daughter, Lisa Marie, and her brother, Paul. And she prays that the violence will end and for justice for George Floyd. We do join you in those prayers, Charlene. Wendy Will Deacon Wendy Williams Brown asks for prayers for Jack. And I have a few hard things to share with you. Um, John Harmon's sister, so sister-in-law of Deacon Clara Harmon, Susan has entered hospice care, so please hold all of them in your prayers. Also, Betty Hugis has fallen and broken her arm. Please reach out to her and hold her in your prayers for healing. And Jan Stanowitz is having surgery tomorrow, so we do ask that you would also keep her in your prayers and reach out to her. And now I'll see. <clears throat> A great joy to see so many visitors worshiping among us online, we welcome you. We're so glad to see you here. And Connie thanks us for prayers and cards and phone calls. She says Tom is doing great and back to his good old self. Great joy. Okay, then friends, would you join me in a moment of prayer? Holy and loving God, we praise you. God in three persons. Blessed Trinity, we ask that you would relax our minds to envision you in the mystery and the truth of who you are, the lover, the beloved, and the loving, joined in an endless dance. We pray that you would come as the fire in our hearts and work with us that we may work for you in your world. Heal us that we may do the work that you call us to do, that it may be nurturing and sustaining for others. We pray that you would create us anew each day, that we may dream your dreams with you of a world where your will may be done. Especially in these destabilizing days, help us to remember that you came to us in human form to dwell with us and to teach us how to dwell with each other. You came as a carpenter with skilled hands, a builder familiar with wood and stone, that you might show us how to build a new kingdom. We ask for your forgiveness for the kingdom we have built, for its many failings, for its violence, its brutality, 
It's willful ignorance and denial. We lift to your care, holy and loving and tender God, all the families who are in agony and mourning this day, the childless mothers and fathers, the parentless children, the bereft beloved ones, especially all those who mourn George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Tony McDade, and all victims of racist violence. We also lift up to your tender care all those who seek reconciliation and healing, forgiveness and softened hearts, opened ears and eyes. We lift to your care those who are exhausted, whose voices are hoarse from crying out for justice, those who have marched until their feet ache. Grant them the justice they seek. Help us to hear again your good news that just as you led your people from enslavement to freedom, that you will lead the people of this nation into a, a new community of liberation from the systems that bind us. We pray that you would teach us to be one as you are one. Teach us to love as you love. Teach us to serve as you serve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And as we come now to this time of offering, we remember that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, and yet the blessings have not been shared equally among us. Some hoard while some go without. We know the needs are very dire during this time when so many have lost jobs. And we do know that the church exists to serve the world, and there are so many ways we've been trying to do that. You all have been so generous with your reaching out to each other and supporting the ministries of this church since the pandemic began. We ask that you would continue to be in touch with each other, keep making those calls and deliveries of groceries, helping each other with yard work, celebrating anniversaries and birthdays. And especially this week, as David said, the need at Mercy Learning Center is very great. I have a suggestion for you. There's a list of the most needed items in the back of the bulletin. Why don't you just cut out that part, put it in your wallet and take it with you to the grocery store and see what things you can check off for our sisters at the Mercy Learning Center. I know diapers are especially needed. I hate to think of mothers needing to and fathers needing to ration um, the diapers that their kids need. So please be very generous. And for your regular offerings and gifts and pledges, we ask that you would continue to make those online. You could also mail in a check to the church and the details of how you can continue to be a faithful member of this community are in your bulletin. Would you join me in prayer? Triune God, you see both within each human heart and with a bird's eye view of your beloved world. Behold us, your people, standing before you with gifts in open hands, at our fingertips, or as buds of intention in our hearts. We offer them to you and pray that you would make something beautiful out of them through the power of your Holy Spirit. Strengthen the bonds between this church and our community Make us conduits of your grace. And while these gifts may be small examples of charity, we also pray that in giving them, they may open up the floodgates and begin the transformative work of building up the kingdom that will make your heart glad. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I invite you to please join in singing be known to us in Breaking Bread, which you will find printed in your bulletin.
Luke the evangelist wrote of our risen Savior, who at the table with two of his disciples took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened and they recognized the risen Christ in the breaking of the bread. In company with all who hunger for spiritual food, we gather around our own tables, but around the one spiritual table in that one house of worship to know the risen Christ in the breaking of the bread. As one people then separated in space, but one in Christ at our tables, in our kitchens and living rooms, our dining rooms, we are truly one in this sacrament of love. So then as we gather, let us adopt a spiritual mind uh, that we may perceive within these gifts of bread and cup, the living presence of Christ who is with us always. Amen. Deacon Clara, yeah. will you please unmute yourself and start over? Thank you. <laughs> please go. join me in the prayer of consecration as printed in your bulletin. We are one bread, one body, one cup of blessing. We are many throughout the earth. And even though our con congregation is scattered, we are one in Christ. In our kitchens and living rooms, let us rest our hands now lightly upon the bread and the cup, which we have set aside today to be a sacrament. Let us ask God's blessing upon them. Let us pray. Gentle Redeemer, there is no lockdown on your blessing and no quarantine on your grace. Send your spirit of life and love, power and blessing upon every table where your children stay safely at home. That this bread may be broken and gathered in love and this cup poured out to give hope to all. Risen Christ, live in us that we may live in you. Breathe in us that we may breathe in you. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take this and eat it, for this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us then in our many places take the bread and break it to receive and share the gift of God, the bread of heaven. And let us join in saying, in the bread we share, we are one in Christ. Let us all partake of the bread. In the same way also, Jesus took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. So let us in our many places take the cup to receive and share the gift of God, the cup of blessing. And would you join me in saying, in the cup we share, we are one in Christ. Let us all partake of the cup. Please join me in the prayer of thanksgiving found in your bulletin. Having eaten at Christ's table, let us give our thanks to God. Let us pray. We give you thanks, almighty God, that you've renewed us at your table by granting us the presence of Jesus Christ. Strengthen our faith in you, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world in courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Savior. Amen.
And so, dear friends, having been nourished at the table of the Lord and the word broken open for us that our living and our daily lives may be instructed and inspired, let us give thanks to God for this assembly and for the faithfulness and courage of this congregation and recommit ourselves to God's purposes in the world and the time which God has entrusted into our care. With the vision of God, the understanding of our identity as a child of God, our shared identity as brothers and sisters of the one God, mother and father of us all, looking back to the great rift in Africa, our ancient home. Let us remember that we are one in you. The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his loving countenance upon you and give you courage and grace and hope this day and always. Amen. God be with you till we meet again. By good counsel, God uphold you. With the shepherd's care and fold you. God be with you till we meet again. Amen. in peace and strength to love and serve the Lord and all God's people. Amen. <laughs>